mexicanos. Ah, eh, <risa> todos los amigos colombianos que yo he tenido son inteligentísimos. <risa> un chico en la universidad en Brasil, mejor, mejor estudiante de la universidad. Después acá en Alemania, durante mi, mi doctorado, una chica de, de, de Colombia también, mi amiga, muy inteligente. Inteligentísima. Ahora tiene su, su firma en Holanda. Y después, cuando yo he vivido en Canadá, había una chica de Colombia, muy bonita, que era de, de la iglesia, ¿eh? considerada genio, ¿Sí? que hacía su maestría en la... Ella había estudiado economía, pero estaba haciendo su maestría en matemática, en la parte más compleja de matemática. Increíble, increíble. Entonces, por favor, no me desapontes, ¿ok? <risa> Vale, vale. Tú precisas quedar en el nivel, nivel de, de los otros colombianos. <risa> Por cierto, eh, ¿vas, a, ¿vas a proyectar algún, a compartir alguna presentación o algo? Sí, sí, yo tengo un slides aquí para presentarlos. Ok, si quieres puedes compartir pantalla para ver de qué funciona bien. Para ver vos si, si está bien, ¿eh? déjame intentar ahora. Déjame colocarlo aquí en Mode Presentation. ¿Tú lo ves? Sí, eso es. Sí, ahora sí lo veo. Ok, so estamos los dos, entonces déjame intentar aquí ver si no hay nada en portugués. Ah, vale. Yo entiendo un poquito también de un portugués. Claro, claro. Somos vecinos, entonces. Sí. Entonces, es más. Kerstin Kulnik. ¿Cómo? So, no, Kerstin said it already. Um, at marriage, but I don't know how to change what I'm saying. No, it's okay. I mean, welcome. So, Adrian already organized everything. We are ready to start. Yes. Oh, your name is has changed now. It's, now it's Kersen Zwitz. Yeah, Zwitz. Um, I know how to change it in uh, Zoom session, but I haven't found out how to change it uh, continually. So I don't have to always change it with when I come onto a meeting. Wow, interesting. I don't even know how to make. I don't even know how my name came up like that. Well, I guess someone has provided. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I have I have a Zoom account. That's the funny thing. Yeah. With this Zoom account, you will keep your name. Uh -huh. And Adrian, from what place in Colombia you come originally from? From the capital, from Bogota. Oh, cool. Yeah. And Kerstin, where do you come from? I'm from Austria. Oh, okay. Where about in Austria? Well, originally I'm from Corinthia, so from the very south. And now I'm living uh, in Styria, which is a bit more in the northeast, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Nadia, quanto tempo vives in España? I have been here from last 15 years. Yeah. Last 15? No, no, six. Six years. Yeah. Six years, okay. A second, let me just stop it for a second that I can. The volume is pretty low. And that's good with the background. People think that I'm at. Like enjoying the beach in Rio de Janeiro. But I'm not. <laughs> Unfortunately. Well, for acoustic reasons, it's good that you aren't at the beach. <laughs> it's in Greece, that one? No, I said for acoustic reasons. It's good that you are not at the beach. Oh. We can hear you as well. 
Well, if it's you're listening to some waves, that is not bad. Well, it's nice, but if there's wind, the microphone. Yeah, that's get. true. That's true. I know. In your five minutes, we will start, but right now we can wait for. Um, just to let you know, you are not sharing your screen. I know, I know. Um, I may have to fix something in my presentation. <laughs> okay, it's okay. Quite last minute read there. And Adrian, do you know, uh, uh, you are the, the organizer of this presentation, right? Uh, we, we are like a team in which uh, we divide the different sessions that we are going to take. And for this session, what I have to do is host mm -hmm. and like have the, we have a following, uh, you know, the step-by-step -step that we have to follow. And for instance, what we issue a course, for example, if you want to make the first prayer and the final one, so I, should I do both prayers or you do the first and I do the last? Yeah, you should, you should both if you, if you want. Or if okay. you, yeah. In that, so, in, in that way, the recording will always keep with, with, start, with you at the start and also in the fin at the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, you tell me, just guide me. You do the, the initial introduction, then I okay. <laughs> and um, another thing I wanted to ask, I forgot. Okay, never mind. So, oh, yeah, how much time do we have? Um, we have near, let me check something. Yes, we have until doo -doo 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 -doo, 8 30. So the yep. service center, an hour and a half. Yep. Yeah, so you you could spend the last 20 minutes for questions. Um, yep. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't believe my presentation will last an hour. Okay. Then it's 40 minutes of questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And which which church do you go to, Adrian, in Spain? In I live in Madrid. Oh, you live in Madrid. Okay. Yeah, for my my, the, my local church is Aluche. Mm -hmm. Iglesia Adventista de Madrid, Aluche. Aluche. Okay. Yeah. Here are. A lot of Romanians. Maybe yeah, there are more Romanians that are Spanish. Then, then sp oh, that's for sure. There are probably more Colombians <laughs> than Spanish people in the yeah. church. It's incredible. <clears throat> Okay, it's seven o'clock, no? Yeah, we could start, so. Yeah, let me share my screen. Mm -hmm.
yeah so we'll be only we three here that will be very cool <laughs> Yeah, so welcome everyone for this session. And um, we are here with the Dr. Rivernino Montenegro and we will start with a prayer and then we will begin the presentation. All right, um, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we would like to start thanking you for your mercy and your love and your forgiveness. And my prayer now, is that once we go through this presentation, we develop a stronger faith in you, in your word, and understanding that is a God in heaven who cares, who is looking at us. Although we all have our doubts and our fears and our weakness, but you are a powerful God who really loves us and is willing to lift us up and take us where we are and develop in us new skills and make of us great, like do great things through us as well. Because we know we can do all things through Christ that strengthen us. But I'm always asking myself what, what you could do through us if, if you want. So we pray that it will be open to let you work in our lives and stay with us now. And especially with the ones who are suffering, having difficulties, at this moment that they can forget their problems and focus on the solution, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In his precious name we pray and we thank you. Amen. Okay, so thanks a lot for having me here. And um, uh, this kind of presentation is a little bit different from the things I'm used to do. Um, to start with, my name is Rivalio Montenegro. I'm not a pastor, I'm not a theologian. I'm actually a scientist. I I develop. Um, I did a, I did my PhD in chemistry, but I work on the medical field. I develop medical devices, especially in startups, you know, small companies. We create devices in the medical field, and then we bring them to market. That's what I do on my on a daily basis. And uh, what the, brought me to Christ. I was 17 years old and I, I was born and raised in a very strong Catholic family in Brazil. My uncle was a priest, all my aunts were nuns. And so it was a very strong Catholic environment, but I had never ever really read the Bible as you guys in the Adventist church do until one day a friend of mine invited me for a Bible study. I want to get into the details of that, but I was 17 years old and then I got fascinated with this book. However, uh, reading the Bible made me have, I, mean, I had a lot of stomach ache while I was reading the Bible, I have to say this, because a lot of stories in the Bible made no sense to me, at least at that time. Like a big whale or fish or whatever was this swallowing a man and this man is alive three days later, or people in the Bible living 900 years so all the stories were quite complicated for me to understand, not to understand, but to believe. And I got very interested in this topic of reading and understanding things in the Bible that apparently make no sense. So I have, may have been making, a, I have done a lot of presentations on this. And this is a specific topic of today, a web, the Bible, people, superstitions, and blind to science. It's a presentation I wanted to do since a long time, but I never had the opportunity until now. And I, I'd like to share with you. Uh, you probably, as a Christian, as a Bible believer, you probably have heard people telling you, oh, people in the Bible, they believed in God because they were superstitious. They didn't know about science. And that's why whatever thing that happened, there was a thunder. And then they believed, oh, there was God who did it because they didn't understand the laws of physics, right? So they combine superstitious thinking and to lack of knowledge. And, and that's what I wanted to talk about. Once we read the Bible and pay attention to the characters, were those people really superstitious? And, and since superstitious thinking is, has a lot to do with lack of knowledge, I will start this presentation talking a little bit of knowledge, of scientific knowledge. I will start to showing you this 
white circle in this black background. And what I wanted to show here is that this white circle represents everything we know, all we know, all that we know, every single equation in mathematics, every, every single reaction in chemistry, every single physics phenomenon, everything we understand that it's in our textbooks, it's represented here in this white circle. What we don't know, it's outside. So we don't know why Alzheimer is like that, for example. We don't know why some planets spin in one direction while others in the other direction. We just don't know. Why the moon, our moon, behaves like that, we also don't know. So we do have a lot of things to study, a lot. And I saw this particular representation in a sketch from someone Unfortunately, I couldn't find it again. It's all this many years ago. I couldn't give the credits. But the idea here is once you are in the center of the circle, let's suppose you just started your studies, you just started learning about a specific topic, let's put like mathematics. You just started. So you are there in the middle of the circle. Everything seems to be in a book or the professors know it. So you talk to people about your questions, your doubts, people like the professionals, the professors, they will tell you the answer. And you feel quite confident in the beginning of your studies. And it doesn't matter which area, it's always like that. You start there in the middle where everything around is known. So you are very far from the border where the unknown starts. As you start growing in this specific field of knowledge, in this specific area, you start going away from the center towards the edge where you will face the unknown. And that's where I want to zoom. Once you are here, let's suppose you are at the end of your master's thesis or your PhD thesis, whatever thing, it doesn't matter which field you are. You started everything, or most what people know or read about that subject, and you, as, an, as a PhD student, you are supposed to bring something new to life. You are supposed to bring a new thing to the scientific community, to the scientific knowledge. People should know it, right? Should learn from what you have developed that was not learned before. People didn't know. So you come to the edge. You come to a point that you are like, oh, I revised everything, I reviewed everything that was known. Now I'm at a, at, a, at a point that I started to see this black background. The things that we don't know, there are too many questions there. And you make a contribution with your thesis. You developed something, you invented something, you discovered something. And the, the purpose of that is expanding the white circle into the unknown. A friend of yours will develop another thesis and he will also add his contribution to the circle. So the human knowledge will increase. So at the end, we expand when we sum up all the tiny theses that are out there, all the tiny experiments that are done and published, we increase the knowledge, the overall knowledge. The problem here is only that this is what we know, that's what we don't know. And the closer you are to the border, the more surprised you will see that what we know is very tiny in comparison to what we don't know. So you, we are there inside this little white circle. And as a matter of fact, when you compare yourself to someone who lived 3,000 years ago, Related to the unknown, we are not very different to them. You may have a cell phone, you may know some laws of physics, but all combined is nothing in comparison to what we don't know and what is still outside to learn. So if someone comes to you and say, I don't believe in God because science doesn't show it or I cannot see it in the scientific world, then you can just say, is that maybe because science didn't breach? God yet, because the unknown is pretty big. 
you can ask, I mean, uh, Mark Philly did this once in a presentation in Eastern Europe when he asked the professors, taking all the knowledge in chemistry and physics, do you know 1% of it? And people didn't know it, of course. So could it be that God is in the other 99% that you don't know? So that's for you to understand. What we know today, it's still very little in comparison to what we don't know. We had this almost the same level as someone 3,000 years ago, although we may know a lot more, but what we don't know is still huge. There are a lot of things to learn. So, and that's why I want you to understand this, that people in the Bible, they knew their limitations as well. And a lot of people today, they don't know their limitations, but still knowing their limitations, they were uh, following, so to say, the natural scientific thinking. And I want to share with you some texts in the Bible, some parts of the Bible. First of all, people in the Bible, they question what didn't make natural sense. You probably know this from Exodus chapter 3, when Moses is in the wilderness and he sees a plant that is burning, it's a burning bush, but it doesn't get extinguished. And Moses looks at this and he doesn't fall on his knees and says, this is God making a miracle. No, the text in chapter three, verse three says that Moses said, what a strange sight. I want to know what is this. So he comes closer to it because it didn't make sense. It didn't make natural sense. He was questioning. If the bush was burning and getting extinguished, he would not even bother because that was the natural process. But he understood the natural process and he comes with a question, why is this happening? The same thing that you and I would do today if we see a, bur a burning bush that doesn't get extinguished. So do you understand the point here? The point here is Moses was acting as you and I would act today, questioning something that doesn't make natural sense. It's the first example. Second example, we have the example of Gideon. You know that God called him to free the Israelites. And all of a sudden, we know the story where he tests if God would be with him or not. So he asks God to please God, I will leave this wool fleece on the floor and I want this wool fleece to be wet tomorrow morning while the floor around is dried. That was the first test. He said, I want to make sure that you are with me. So I want to see something big. In the morning, he goes, he takes the fleece, and when he squeezes, a lot of water comes out. The floor around was dried. And that comes the striking part of this text. He looks and he says, hey, God, please don't be angry with me. But look. That's the obvious thing. A fleece is a more compact, like uh, with a 3D structure, water will be locked inside. It makes sense if it has rained, the heat of the, uh, in the morning would evaporate the water around and the water inside this structure, this 3D structure of the fleece would be trapped. So it, obviously this thing would get, stay, stay wet. So I want something else, sorry. I, I mean, sorry to, to bother you guys, but please let's do the opposite. Because now I want the floor to be dried and the fleece, I'm sorry, the floor to be wet and the fleece to be dry because that's way more complicated and goes against the logic. So do you understand that when he asks to do this test, because that was his, he was testing hypothesis here, he's showing up very uh, like, common scientific thinking. It is not someone stupid. It's someone who says, man, I, yeah, of course, the floor can dry quick. I mean, I want to see something different. So I want to make sure. And this is important for you to understand. When he did this, he had to have already an experience, an experience with the angel of the Lord. You, if, you read the, if you read Judges chapter 6, you will see that the angel comes to him, talks to him, tells him to prepare an offer, tells him, put some food on the, on the altar, and then he sends fire from heaven to consume the thing. So he had to have this experience, this spiritual, this divine experience beforehand, 
but still he was not 100% sure. So these people act like, like you and I, or even more skeptical than you and I would act. So he still wanted to do the test. And he repeated the test using another variable now, another a change in the experiment, his change in the experiment. That is fascinating. That's what we do in science every day. We do an experiment, we change the variables, we want to make sure that the thing will work, so we change the subjects. So we test. And that's what this man was doing in the Bible. He was not just taking it for granted. As most people would think, ah, oh, he was superstitious. No, he was testing. I want to make sure. Beautiful example, not a beautiful example, Daniel chapter one. Daniel and his friends were taken captive to, to Babylon. In Babylon, they were supposed to go through a trial, a test, to see who would be the most intelligent. But during this training period, they were supposed to eat and drink the food of the king. And when Daniel and his friends look at these things, they were not food and, and drinks that were suited to a man of God. He said, I cannot pollute myself. And Daniel talks to the boss in the palace and tells him, man, look, we don't eat this. We don't drink this. And the man says, you have to. And he says, no, please give us only vegetables and water to drink. And the man says, I can't. Because if I do this, the other, the other young people will be strong and healthy, while you guys will be weak. And the king will be mad at me because I didn't give the same type of food to everyone. Look at this, normalization. He wanted everyone to be at the same condition. That's a very interesting thought. But Daniel comes to him and says, why don't you do a test? Why don't you observe us in the next few days and you compare our health to the health of the other group of people that are eating the normal food? Do you understand that this is the first example in human literature talking about at least the first one that I know, I don't know any, any older text in the Bible, oh, sorry, in the literature, that talks a control group? Control group is a new thing in science that we have to use if we're developing in my field, in the medical field, we always have to have a control group. You probably heard about the placebo effect, right? When you develop a new medicament, a new medicine, a new drug, and you want to test, you have to compare this against a placebo, which is a drug that doesn't have the active ingredient. It's just like a sugar pill. So, but they look the same, but they one had the active ingredient, that's the real drug, the other one's the placebo. The people who are taking, they don't know which one they are taking, but the scientists know who is taking the placebo and who is taking the drug. So they do it as a control group. They wanted to see if it's not only a mental effect, if there is indeed a biological effect coming from the drug. But this method is relatively new in science. It's not very old. But we see this Daniel offering the man to do it, the leader there who, uh, he was, who was taking care of the young people who would be tested. So he says, let's, man, just do the control group, just compare it. And that's what the man did. Daniel did not expect this man to believe in God as Daniel did. And then Daniel just offered him, and let's do a control group. Just look at the control group. And can you understand how fascinating it is to see that was the first clinical trial in the field of dietary? You know, the, the, the food science, so to say. It was the first clinical trial using a control group. Like 200 years ago, people were not using really control groups doing, doing research. And now you have a text from, from 2,400, 2,500 years ago, or 2,700 years ago, where the man is doing this, where they were using control group. It just shows how not superstitious they were. They were following science, as we know today. That's fascinating. Another interesting example in the Bible shows that they were not superstitious. They didn't believe until presented with a clear evidence. You remember the example of Thomas? The other apostles told him, we saw Christ resurrected. What did Thomas say? I don't believe until I put my finger in the wounds. 
And we are talking about a man who was with the apostles all the way. He saw miracles. He saw the he saw Lazarus resurrecting. He saw so many others uh, be resurrected, being healed, and still he needed hardcore evidence. And this is a fascinating thing. So it's another evidence to you and me that those people in the Bible they were just normal people. Although I'm not really a big fan of like eye evidence or eyewitness evidence or I have to see to believe because Jesus himself first says to Thomas, no, you, you had to see to believe, but blessed is the one who didn't see, but believe. But also because if for you to believe, you have to see, we have a problem. And the problem could be that you were putting sight as the ultimate decision maker. So what you see is the reality. And that's a problem. And I will tell you why it's a problem. I worked when I was living in Canada. I did research and, and drug depots. We were trying to develop some technology for drug delivery uh, to patients with um, schizophrenia. So what happened with a schizophrenic person? He sees things. And that's why he believes, because he sees. And so you see the, 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 the tricky part here is that if you only believe in what, we, what you see, then a schizophrenic could have the rights to say, no, what I see here is the reality. So this is a, it's a big problem. And, and that's why I don't like it. Or oh, one day, for example, I, I had a big pain in my back. So I was laying down and then I, I had to take a medicine a painkiller. So what happened this day was an interesting thing because I had read in the, in, in the uh, information about that medicament, that the medication, that one of the side effects was hallucination. And I knew hallucination could happen if I was taking that medication against my pain. But as you and everyone, almost everyone else, we usually don't care much about possible side effects. And I had a lot of pain, so I took the, I took the medication. And while when I lay down on my bed, all of a sudden I see two men entering my room. One was Leon, uh, Lionel Messi, the other one was Cristiano Ronaldo. Both of them entered in my room. They, they invited me to play football with them. So I knew it was a hallucination because I knew the potential side effects of that drug. But what if I had no clue about this? That could be. I would have to believe because I would be the guy who says, I only believe in what I see. So I had just seen. So that's, that's why seeing is not the best thing. But, and you, for example, if you say, oh, um, I love my wife or my wife loves me or my mother loves me, how do you know how you don't see love, right? It's a complicated thing. But the point here is that Thomas, he had to see, he needed like hardcore evidence for him in order to believe. And this is another indication he was not superstitious. Another example in the Bible that, that shows clearly how much these people act or use the, the logic and the natural uh, science or the things that they knew about science is when Mary, who is pregnant, comes to, to Joseph, her husband-to-be, and says, listen, Joseph, I'm pregnant. And the Holy, and, and I'm pregnant because of the Holy Spirit. So she tells it to Joseph. Did he believe? Of course not. He didn't believe in that. Why? Because it, it was not the natural way of becoming pregnant. First thing came to his mind was, oh, man, she had an affair with someone else. She is now pregnant. And now she comes with this story. And he was ready to leave his wife to be. So he was ready to go away. And why? Because it was a normal reaction of, of any human being who thinks scientifically. Hey, people don't get pregnant if not by having sex. So what's going on here? That's what that was his thinking. And uh, it was the normal thinking, as a human would think. If it wouldn't be for an angel that came and talked to Joseph, he would have left. It just shows to you and me that they were normal and 
or even Mary, when the angel comes and, and he talks to Mary, you will, be, you will be pregnant of the Son of God. And Mary says, and she, just, she was just a young girl. And she said, listen, I'm not even married. How could I be pregnant? It's another normal human reaction. And everything there was new to them. What? To be pregnant from the Holy Spirit? It was as you and I would react today. So when we read the Bible and we see those people there, you have to understand, we are looking at very normal people. We are looking at people who had feelings like you and I. They were not made up characters. They would believe in any story. No, that's the fascinating thing of the Bible. It shows this. Oh, look at Abraham. He knew God was with him, but he lied because he was afraid. All this tiny evidence show to you and me that these people in the Bible, they were real. They were normal people that God has chosen. And he can choose you and, I, and me today. So, the other interesting thing about the people in the Bible, they used human logic. And a human logic that the listeners could understand. Think about Paul when he was preaching in Athens. He delivers a message to philosophers. He now doesn't do the same type of sermon as Peter did in Jerusalem. Or as he himself has preached many times in the synagogues. He had to use a different logic, a logic that people understand. He did not come hoping, not only hoping, but expecting the others to believe the way he believed. Because he knew these people have a different background. These people here, they don't know what I know. And this is a fascinating thing about Paul. In this specific case, he's showing his human nature, the logic. He says, I I cannot talk to a Greek using Hebrew logic. I have to talk to a Greek using Greek logic that they can understand. If I talk to a Hebrew, I use Hebrew logic. So when I see this text, he doesn't come with the same speech. He comes with a different logic. And this is a clear indication to me that these people were normal people. They were not superstitious. And actually, where are you in, your, in the circle of the whole knowledge that we have? Now, are you close to the border of the unknown or not? Because although we are all like swimming from the center of this, you know, specific areas of work to the border, for example, if you ask me, if, if I would have to talk now about something that I don't understand, so... I would read some books and I would be then in, in the beginning, the center of the circle with very little knowledge. And I would have to grow, grow and develop and do research and learn more until I get to the border where I see, man, there are too many things that we don't. But what I wanted to tell is that although the people in the Bible, they behaved 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, they behaved like you and I are behaving today, right? And apparently we know a lot more than they knew back then, but compared to what we don't know, it's negligible because what we don't know is huge. But with all this, there are a lot of things that happen today in our lives that point to divine intervention. Those things that are like, wow, this couldn't be by chance. And I'll give one example. I'll give two, if you, if you allow me. The first one, I was, um, I was invited uh, to, to, to deliver a, a series of talks in Romania. And in Romania, they have translated my book. I wrote a book called Joseph, CEO and President, Not Only a Dreamer. And this book was then translated to Romania. And the book is about helping young people how to be successful in their lives and how to be like to follow the steps of joseph of egypt and that's why the title is joseph ceo and president because it talks about joseph getting to the point that he became the leader of in egypt but the point was i was invited to go to romania spend like a weekend there and deliver messages on the, on this topic to our young people so at the end, the last day I was there at the university, the Adventist school there, 
a meeting at the at the restaurant there with some students and there was this particular student that who was talking to me and while we are talking all of a sudden i hear a voice and the voice says give 100 euros to him so i stopped i looked around and I'm like, what's going on here and i'm and i'm looking at this guy he's he kept talking to me we are talking about the student life and so on and i'm looking at him and i, I am with this thought in my mind give him 100 euros and i'm like what's going on and of course i didn't want to give 100 euros to anyone and i just like tried to shook away this to shake away this um to get rid of this thought but then we said goodbye to each other i went to my room to pack my things and then go to the airport to fly back to germany so on the way to my room i heard that again saying give 100 euros to him I, I thought, man, why this and then i prayed to god i said god in the unlikely event there is a hundred euro bill in my wallet i will give to him so if i have a hundred euros there i will give so i go to my room i open my wallet and there i had a hundred euros and i was like i can't believe now i'll have to give so long story short i took an envelope i put the 100 inside i wrote the name of that student i went out waited for the car to, that would take me to the airport and i was hoping that i wouldn't meet the student luckily enough i thought i didn't meet him he was not coming so when i was about to enter the car another student passed nearby and i look at the student and said hey buddy here's an envelope you have to give to student blah 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 so i told him the name and he knew the student said yeah no more I, I will hand over to him the envelope i said thank you very much i went to the car or went to the airport and the airport i took my plane back to germany when i landed in germany i turned on my cell phone and there is a message a message from that student to whom i sent a hundred euro and that student wrote a message saying listen you don't know much about my life i didn't tell you what were my needs and my problem. we were talking about other other topics but i wanted to tell you the following today was the last day to pay the the student fee and the problem was the following i had borrowed money from another student to pay my fee for the university and this student didn't have more money to pay his fee so he would be out of the university in the last semester and the point was when that student that you gave the envelope to gave to me the envelope and i opened the envelope there was a hundred euro inside it was the money that i had to pay back to the student that he could pay his fees and continue at the university and guess who was the student that i had to pay to the one you gave the envelope to so and i was thinking in my mind, well what are the probabilities what are the statistics here that i would have this sort of thought of giving a hundred euros to this guy and being the hundred years the amount of money he needed and i would give exactly to the student that he was supposed to pay back so this is a fascinating story to me that shows well there are a lot more things that goes beyond our understanding of science right and that tells me a lot the other thing that i wanted to share with you that talks about a lot of things go they they go beyond uh, our knowledge of science and and clearly we can see god we don't have to see miracles all the time in order to see god but some, very often god will do miracles for us and it's not a big problem if you have doubts and if you have problems to believe in everything but it's interesting to record and and count the blessings and the big things god has done in your life so there was a moment i was um in in canada when i was working there i started my first company and what happened back then was i didn't find investors we lost everything we, we lost everything we had and we lost the patents we, we lost the money i had so anyway at the end of the day i had no money and i was living in a house of a friend of mine who who just took care of me for one year you know because i couldn't get a job 
And during this time, you know, when you have problems, then you find time to pray and you find time to read the Bible. So there I was reading a lot of the Bible and pray. And that's the time, by the way, that I wrote the book about Joseph of Egypt. So when I was there, very down because of my professional future, because nothing was working, I got to know a family in Canada. This family, uh, they had two children. The couple had two children, one boy and a girl. Uh, the girl was 13 years old. And the girl was sick since a year old, since she was a year old. A very weird disease, nobody knew what she had. So she was taken to a hospital, they did MRI, they did all type of testing, and they couldn't find out what she had. So they took her to churches and nothing worked. So they did everything they could, nothing, absolutely nothing worked. So sometimes the girl would be blind, sometimes she would be paralyzed. And almost every night she would try to get a knife and kill her father. So long story short, they got to know this family and, and they asked me if I could help somehow. So I came to the family and we had a conversation and at the end we had a conversation about God and it turned out the girl was demon possessed. And she was 12 years old, long, 12 years long possessed. So remember, she was only 13 years old and she was 12 years long demon possessed and you may ask i mean how do you know what's demon possessed well there were a lot of indications one of them was the demon was talking to us sometimes but again it could be just a psychological problem right let me get to the end of this time. so i had then the chance to give bible studies to this family i had a chance to be like on call to this family because remember i had no job i was living in a house of a friend and i was going to this house almost every day we had an exorcism almost every single day. At the end of the story, the whole family decided for baptism. The girl too, the neighbor who saw all the suffering and all the problems, he came to the Bible studies and he was baptized too. So what happened is, at the day, in the day of the, of the baptism, she was, uh, the baptism was scheduled to four o'clock in the afternoon, 10 o'clock in the morning, she got demon possessed again. And that lasted until four o'clock in the afternoon getting better, getting worse, getting better, getting worse. It's four o'clock, she got better and she said, please baptize me now. We entered the, to the, we came to the bottom of the baptismal tank, the demon took her again. And in the end, I had to enter in the tank with her, her father and her brother and her mother. We all entered together holding her in our arms because she wouldn't enter. She would try to, to kill us the outside. So we entered the tank and the pastor prayed and we baptized the girl. So she came out of this. She never had a problem again. So this was in 2006. So since 2006, this girl never had a problem again, right after this baptism. So next Sunday, next Saturday, sorry, next Sabbath in the church, uh, one of the deacons of the church came to talk to me and he said, Rivalino, I don't think she was demon possessed. I think she had epilepsy. Then I told him, let's take the water of the baptismal tank, fill out in small bottles and let's sell it. We found the cure for epilepsy. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what she had, the girl was healed. If you say, oh, she had an emotional problem, she was healed through the process of giving or surrendering herself to God. Whatever thing you may imagine, whatever reason or thinking you have she was healed it could be epilepsy it could be demon possession it could be anything the point was or is she was healed and that's the things a lot of things i mean we look at the people in the bible they were like you and i swinging between divine intervention and logic and science so, and that's what I wanted to show in this presentation to you. It took me roughly 40 minutes to describe what I have learned looking at the people in the Bible, seeing that they're like you and I, they were not very different. They were not superstitious. They had divine experiences and they also used logic and science to evaluate the experiences they had. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to listen to your questions in case you have them.
So you guys feel free to turn on your mics and ask questions. Or you can also write in the chat if you don't feel comfortable asking questions. Well, that's not quite to the topic, but you, you mentioned Jonah and the big fish in the beginning. Have you uh -huh. found an answer? Have I what? Found an answer? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I have another presentation that I'm working on this. Uh, first of all, the biggest discussion actually that happens among scientists, not scientists, but theologians, I would put this way, it's not if he was really swollen by this monster of the sea. Actually, they, they have more problems to find out who, is the, who was the king who converted in Nineveh. So how do I know that that story can be definitely true and without a problem? First, there are many cases, scientific cases, like proved of animals that were swollen by whales and they were found later alive. We're talking about big animals that were there alive living in the valley of whales. So this is easy to, to find. Uh, can a man, because that's the biggest issue, can a man survive? Uh, the animal survive, but the question is about what about with very little oxygen there? Because if you are in a chamber and you spend many, many hours inside a chamber, it's a small one, oxygen will be consumed, right? So we had a case with uh, a, a boat that sunk and the the cook of this boat was a nigerian guy he's still alive so the, the the he was in the washroom when the the boat sank so in the end he was locked inside a little room i forgot how many square meters had this room or how many cubic meters had but it was very small and he was there in this little room at the bottom of the sea for 60 hours, no, six zero, not 16, six zero, until divers came and like everyone died, but this guy, the, the cook of the boat, and they rescued him. And everyone was asking, because that was the most amazing, how did he survive with so little, like with the risk of getting contaminated of CO2? That was, of course, he was expiring CO2, right? They inspire oxygen and putting outside CO2. So that comes the fascinating thing. CO2 dilutes in the water very easily. So every time without knowing, every time he hit the water, he made the CO2 to dissolve inside so that he wouldn't get uh, intoxicated. Remember, Jonas, was also in an environment full of water that was probably moving. So the movement of the water would take up the CO2 to make sure that he wouldn't get uh, intoxicated. So that's how I see today. So Jonah is not a problem. It's not, it's not the, the biggest issue of, of the many apparently crazy stories in the Bible. Jonah is pretty fine. What was the animal? We have no idea. A middle age, I mean, we have here mines, for example, there is a museum, a Roman, uh, uh, a naviga an ancient navigation Roman museum, and you see some paintings from like 2,000 years old, and in, in those paintings, you don't have a whale, you have, you have like a, a monster. We just don't know what was the animal that had swollen Jonah to make him by surviving, that he survived all this time. The, but again, theoretically speaking, there is no problem for this, for this to, to happen. It's more complicated actually is how come that the whole city converted. Actually, this is the biggest uh, issue, not that he was swollen there. Impressive, thank you. You're welcome. Do you know what to search for to find the evidence for animals surviving in, in whales? Yeah, I mean, if you, if, I mean, I have an article, if you want, I can send to you, if you share me, it's, it's actually, a, I think it's a PhD thesis, but there are many of them. If you go to Google and say animals that were found alive in the belly of whales, you'll surely find 
but they're mostly scientific articles. There are some stories of people who were found alive in the belly of their whales, but they were not scientifically proven. So we don't know if they really happened or was just, you know, some exaggerations. That I don't know any hardcore evidence, <laughs> let's put it this way. But for the animals, there are a lot of scientific evidence that shows this. Like, like you people have found sharks that were alive. So I have here a question from Karen Flores. I have seen cases of people with multiple personality disorder who seem to be related to demonic possessions. Where the line between the scientific and spiritual fields very short. How can you achieve a balance and teamwork between different disciplines and how and know how to identify that line? Thank you very much, Karen. This is um, an extremely important, interesting, and unfortunately tough question. Uh, but I'll tell my experience. Um, what I do when people, and I have been in many situations where people were demon possessed, and, and also in case that they were not demon possessed, but they, people thought they were demon possessed. So I will tell you what I do to identify if it's really demon possession or just a disability or an emotional problem. It could also be an emotional problem. And if you're a very spiritual person, easily influenced, let's put it this way, it can also happen, you know, that you start believing this. But your question is very important because we at a church, in the church, we are not prepared to deal with these uh, cases. We just are not prepared. We don't talk about this. This is a big problem in our church. We don't know how to do a lot of things. We just take it as everything is black and white, everything is fine. Or we just think that Satan doesn't come in our church because we are too holy. It's a big mistake. We should learn how to. And whatever people in our church try to do an exorcism, they would just follow the example of Pentecostals that are doing on TV with these big shows. I could share with you many of the experience that I lived, that I went through, but I will tell you what I do to know if it's indeed or not um, a case of demon possession. Every time I meet someone who is suspicious of having this problem, I ask this person to read one Bible text. And this Bible text is James chapter 4, verse 7. So you can write this down if one day you come across the situation. So far, every person who was demon-possessed, indeed demon-possessed, was not able to read the text. The other ones who thought they were demon-possessed and so on, they read it. So I came with a text and said, could you read this Bible verse? And it happened to a German girl, for example, here. Because when we talk about demon possession, a lot of people think, oh, it's just things in, in Brazil, in Africa, or Latin America. But it happens in Europe. I have been in many situations here. And one case was this German girl who grew up in East Germany, by the way. So she grew up in an atheistic environment. She had no idea about God, she never heard about Bible and all those things. Until she, after the fall of communism and so on, so many years later, she moved to a study here nearby where I live. And during, through her studies, she started getting involved with some um, spiritual things that was done at the university. That's the interesting thing, although it seems to be very uh, non-religious things, universities, right? But she was there and she got involved with this and then she started having weird feelings, feelings of someone was observing her all the time. She had a friend who was an Adventist and her friend invited her to come to church. And then she came to church and then she told me her story, said, I don't know what's going on with me. I feel very weird. I'm having very depressive thoughts and it's very strange. And do I have Satan maybe inside me? But I don't even believe in anything like that. That's what she, that was an interesting thing. So I took the Bible. I put on her hands and I opened this text of James chapter 4 verse 7 that says, Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And I asked her, could you read this text? And her mouth was shut. She couldn't read. And that's the moment I realized, no, she has indeed a spiritual problem. 
So we spent hours praying together. The whole church did like a prayer chain. You know, we spent the whole weekend praying for her. And then later she came to my house. We prayed for six hours and then she was free. Until today she's free. So that was a case. There, there, were, there was another case, however, that was not a spiritual problem. It looked like a lot, but the person could read the text and said, man, you don't have really this spiritual problem. So it could be something else. It could be even like, as you said, a bipolar disorder. It could be schizophrenia. It could be many things. It could be a, you know, I, I had a friend in Brazil that he had a lack of a mineral in his brain. I forgot, or metal in his brain. I forgot which one was that. He had to take the pill. And every time he didn't take the pill, he thought he was Jesus Christ. And he would go running on the streets saying, I'm Jesus, I'm Jesus. So he was not demon possessed. It was a pure, like, biological or chemical reaction that was happening in his brain. Until one day he came home and he said to his mom, Mom, now I, I'm, I believe that I'm not Jesus. And his mom was like, why? He said, there were five Jesus in the hospital today. So, you know, there are, but there are cases and cases. And, and that's why it's important to know how to deal with this, that we don't put everyone on the side of Satan. And they may not be. They may just have a chemical problem. And they could be, could be treated with a medication, solve the problem. But in some cases, they really have spiritual problems. That you probably heard about a movie. It's an old movie. I don't recommend movies to people, but this one's called The, the Witches of Salem, or Salem's Witches. I don't remember exactly the title. But in this movie, they, they do this. They, there were some weird behaviors there and they were calling everyone had witches everyone was a witch and everyone for sake they were killing people it's all based on the true story and we as christians we should be very careful when we make such assumptions so we have to be very careful with this that's why studying talking about this it's extremely important that we don't make mistakes on this okay i hope i, I answered your question do we have more questions so yeah, the text is James 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. It's very important to talk about the issues, indeed. And then there is the, okay, I got your email. Um, any other question could be related to science, as we just talked, or to um, any of the topics that we have been talking about. No more questions. You guys are fine. So let me ask you guys a question then. So Kerstin, I know, is from Austria. Karen, where are you from? And Louis Guy and GGG. Where are you guys from? So I am GG. Yeah, I don't know why I have to actually fix my, uh, my uh, name there. My name is Galina. I'm from Bulgaria, but now I live in Belgium. Cool, Galina, nice seeing you. And Louis Guy is also from Belgium. I have the feeling that I have met you before, Louis. And Karin is from Paraguay, right? Nice seeing you. Okay, so if you guys have no more questions, so Karin, we are neighbors then, because I'm originally from Brazil, but I live in Germany. Anyway. If you guys have no more questions, then we have to close the session. Right, Adrian? Yes, we can finish with a prayer. Yeah, let's do it. Let us pray then. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and your forgiveness. Thanks that we have learned through this presentation now, this discussion that people in the Bible, they are just normal people like we are today. And if you did great things through these people in the past, you can do it through us. So therefore, we would like to submit ourselves to you, that the devil can flee from us. Stay on our side, the Lord, forgive us, cleanse us. If anyone here is facing a hard time, a hard problem, let your love cover this person. May your angels go around that you may heal all diseases, because you promised that you give us the power to heal all diseases. There is nothing that you cannot do, and we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. Lord, nothing can separate us from your love, and that's why I pray now and I thank you 
that you still you continue with us in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, I pray and I thank you. Amen. Okay, guys, it was very nice talking to you. I wish you all God's blessing. And enjoy the rest of the ASI conference. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you, too.